uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank, thank you to the organizers of AdventureX for hosting this great gathering and letting me come up here and ramble on for a bit about one of my favorite subjects, politics. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Uh, I love talking about world building, but like a lot of people, I try to tend to avoid the subject of politics in polite company. Um, but you may have heard a saying, uh, you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Uh, increasingly, I'm starting to think that world building is politics. And there are some things that we just have to think about when we get into the business of telling stories and constructing whole imagined worlds. So before I get into all of that, uh, let me give you a little background on who I am and the kind of work that I do. Um, so I'm a game designer, writer, and editor. I'm based in Brooklyn. Um, I do a bunch of different things, uh, but my primary interests are in world building and narrative design, um, with a particular fondness for adventure games. Um, so I got my start at Muse Games, which is a tiny little indie studio in New York. Uh, the first game I made there is Creavers. Uh, it's a puzzle platformer with uh, cute little creatures set in a magical forest. Um, I did game design and level building and what little scanty bit of world building and story that there was to hold the whole thing together. Um, and then once we had a platformer under our belt, our next title, Guns of Icarus Online, uh, was a team-based multiplayer online post-apocalyptic steampunk airship shooter going on MMO. Uh, since it was something of a studio credo that we should never really exactly have quite a handle on what we're doing. Um, so in addition to doing design there, I was the team's sole writer and world builder. I uh, also accidentally ended up being in charge of communications, uh, community, and moderation. Uh, that's another story. Um, my next regular studio job after, what, uh, after Muse was at What Pumpkin Studios. Um, I was a writer and creative director on Hive Swap, which is the point-and-click adventure game based on the webcomic Homestuck, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, the screenshots here are actually from the original 3D version that we were developing at the New York studio before it got switched over to, uh, to 2D. And the first episode of that actually launched just this past summer. Uh, so after that, I kind of leaned into the freelance life and opened Paperback Studio. Uh, so under this banner, I offer a range of services from narrative consulting to copy editing. Um, but what I really love is the diversity of game projects that as a freelancer I now get to write for. Um, so very quickly, uh, just some of my current projects. Uh, Gallic Lighter is a digital card slash 4x strategy game with a space exploration theme. Uh, it's set four billion years in the future when the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are colliding. Uh, and world building for this setting with, you know, its eons of history and all kinds of strange alien creatures uh, is really a blast. Um, the Last Goddess is a point-click adventure game uh, mystery set in near future Tampa, Florida. Uh, and you have an unlikely cast of protagonists, including a government investigator, a graphic designer, an ad copywriter, and a doctoral student of folklore. Uh, so this is another really fun world to play in. Uh, finally, I'm narrative consultant and editor on Lamplight City, a uh, forthcoming detective adventure game you may have heard about by Grindislav Games. Uh, I believe it's actually being demoed here today, so you might be able to pop out and check it out. Um, so that's a broad overview of uh, what I've done and kind of where I'm coming from as a writer and world builder. Now please enjoy this image of worldbuilding.jpg while I say a few words about why I want to give this talk. Uh, so it was inspired by my work teaching and critiquing the works of novice game builder, uh, world builders and students um, and looking at the work of professionals and recognizing some trends and common pitfalls. Um, so this talk isn't meant to be overly prescriptive or dogmatic. Uh, you know, kind of the same things Dave said, like your mileage may vary, everybody works differently. Um, it's not to chastise anyone for doing world building wrong. Um, but it is meant to give you something new to think about, maybe, and some ideas to help you when you sit down to create your own worlds, uh, with the ultimate goal of having more unique, diverse, delightful, inspiring, welcoming worlds for us all to play in. All right, so let's get right to it. Why do we have to talk about politics? Because all art is political. 
whether the artist thinks so or not. Uh, this has always been true, but in the current highly charged climate, uh, it's kind of even more true. Um, walking down the street is political. Just breathing is political for some. Uh, game developers especially have been getting a lot of attention lately for getting a lot of attention. Um, there's a lot of scrutiny, a lot of drama, and increasingly some abuse for what used to be a largely blissfully apolitical activity, making games. But on the positive side, many developers are now being more mindful and thoughtful about the kind of experiences their games offer, uh, and trying to make a positive impact on the world. Um, but there are also some who are afraid to speak up, afraid to cause a fuss or become too visible or become a target. You've probably heard this line before, typically just after someone gets in hot water for something that they've made. It usually comes right on the heels of this one. But what it really means is this. If you're not setting out to craft an intentional message when you create something, then you're probably broadcasting one or several of them unintentionally. Um, maybe messages like these. <laughs> When the politics of your work go unexamined, they tend to uphold the status quo, or reflect cultural stereotypes, or your own implicit biases. I'd like to tell you a story about teenage dragon riders. Way back very early in my editing career, I beta read a story written by my junior high school boyfriend. Uh, this is not his art or mine, by the way, although it very well could have been. Goodness knows we both had notebooks filled with this kind of stuff. Uh, I should probably give Anne McCaffrey more credit than I do for my career trajectory. Um, so this story was about this clan of teenage dragon riders uh, who lived together in this fortress. And I dimly recall that they had some kind of supernatural or maybe telepathic towers, and they also all magically stopped aging at age 19, staying young forever. Now, you can probably identify this as the imaginings of a bookish teenage nerd who likes to escape into fantasy novels and can't even imagine life after high school. I mean, he wasn't even holding out for drinking age, in the US at least. Uh, so this particular perspective, the world building and the story that he created kind of limited the appeal of the work to a very, very narrow audience that was substantially similar to the author. Um, i.e. him and me, his nerdy bookish girlfriend. Uh, and that's about it. And even I thought it might be nice to be in my 20s someday. <laughs> but I doubt it ever occurred to him just what an odd detail that was or what a radically strange world it would lead to. So there's a bit by comedian Andy Kindler from the show Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist that has always stuck with me. He says, so we did some focus groups, and we found out that my target audience is men my age who are me. <laughs> that seems to be the group of people most into what I'm doing. So the elements of an imagined world reveal something about the perspective and perhaps the limitations of the author. And if we're not careful about carefully constructing our meanings with intention, then the unintended revelations pile up. So world building is a form of rhetoric. When we actively use our worlds to construct meaning, that's a rhetorical exercise, arranging elements in a particular way to make a point or produce a specific reaction in an audience. Um, Ian Bogos makes this point in his excellent book, Persuasive Games. And he's talking more specifically about the rhetorical uses of simulation in mechanical game systems, and would probably take issue with my even mentioning him in this context. Um, but I would argue that uh, many of the same principles apply to author narrative content as well. And particularly when you're talking about building an imagined world, which is, after all, an accounting of the systems underlying the surface narrative layer of your story. So the real world in all its total complexity is completely incomprehensible. It's a truism that any map that contains every detail of the terrain would be useless since it would be the size of the terrain itself. So a map, like any representation, is a rhetorical simplification. 
And just like every real world historical account has some underlying theory or framing device that dictates its focus and makes it comprehensible. Geographic determinism, Marxism, great man theory. Um, so does every fictional history. And doubly so because as a world builder, you get to choose not just how to present the facts, but what those facts even are. Look, here's another worldbuilding.jpg. <laughs> so you want to build a compelling, well thought out world with intent that doesn't just reflect your own implicit biases and assumptions with awareness of the statements you're making. So how do you actually go about doing this? As a world builder, essentially, you need to create a simplified, comprehensible sociology, economy, ecology, geology, cosmology, et cetera, et cetera choosing the elements that are most important or relevant to the message of your work. And this can go deep. Uh, for Gala Collider, I have a document in the Story Bible called The World of Gala Collider with headings like space and time <laughs> and a timeline of the universe starting at the Big Bang and going to four billion years in the future. Your projects may have different requirements for levels of detail, but I like to go deep. Um, so there are a few different levels that you can build this on. Um, geography and ecology is where we usually start, especially those geographic determinists among us. Uh, draw a map, make some squiggly lines for coasts and rivers, and inverted Vs for mountains, and you're done. World, right? Um, so this is the map that I made for Guns of Icarus online, by the way, and that's literally how I started from the land. I stitched together satellite images of terrain, then looked to see where settlements and cities might spring up, what resources they'd have access to, how trade routes would flow, and civilizations form, um, very bottom up. This is a lot of fun, <laughs> and it's easy to get stuck on this level, uh, sketching squiggly coastlines forever, but there's more. Next level up is a simulation of the physical conditions and material resources of your world. Where does stuff come from? Where does waste go? It doesn't mean actually running the simulation in your game or detailing every aspect, but just enough to know that it makes logical sense or at least is plausible. If you have a massive city in the middle of the barren desert and you don't have natural resources and trade, or tribute of conquered peoples, magical power sources, sci-fi replicators, something, to explain how they get food and water, you might have some work to do. But don't spend too long on this level either. Next, political, economic, and class systems. Hey, it's politics. Um, so this is where things get more interesting. Uh, how are these systems organized? How did it come to be that way? How did geography and historical events combine to give rise to these systems? And more important, how are things in your world different from the real world systems that we actually know? What interesting combinations can you make? Maybe feudalism with representative democracy. Why not? Next level is culture, arts, philosophy, theology. What are they like? How are they different from our own world and why? And I do apologize for using this all old white men club as a stand-in for the concept of arts and culture. See the problem of iconic representation. Nothing says philosophy like a beardy Greek guy. Um, anyway, these levels are all intertwined and they feed back on each other. So reflect on how they're related in the real world and let that inform your fiction. World builders are polymaths. Building imaginary worlds demands a lot of real world knowledge and a lot of research. In a sense, you are what you eat, so pay attention to your media diet and don't let games or fictional worlds be your only models. Your source should be life in all its complexity. Consume voraciously. In fantasy and speculative world building, this often means reaching toward other cultures, other times and places for inspiration. But this comes with a certain risk of committing that old-fashioned, newfangled sin, cultural appropriation. Maybe that possibility scares you. We all need to be mindful of the problems that come from simply transposing exotic flavors from other cultures without regard to the origin and meaning of those signifiers. Before you borrow some pat visual motifs like jungle tribal to dress up your fantasy worlds, <laughs> consider that those representations have a history in our culture. Sometimes a long and unsavory one. 
very long. <laughs> the urtext for this idea is Edward Said's Orientalism. Said deconstructs historical Western representations of this romanticized, exoticized East, what we used to call the Orient. And whether or not you read the book, you should be familiar with this concept because it comes up again and again. We've come a long way, but our pop culture and media are by no means free of these problems. So this is why, when you are developing fictional places, you should be very wary of the fictional Middle Eastern nation. Location from the Transformers cartoon, by the way. Or the generic Native American tribe. Apparently the cultural consultant who was responsible for developing Chakotay's background on Voyager was some kind of fraudster who falsely claimed Cherokee heritage in order to land writing gates. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> At least the show's producers tried by hiring a cultural consultant, and more on that later. Um, oh, how about the unnamed African country? Literally the setting of Far Cry 2. That's what they called it, or didn't call it. Um, so if you're ever tempted to create a locale that sounds like one of those, ask yourself this. If a country were based in your home country or generally a place you knew well, would you be equally likely to invent a fake, generic city or state or region as the backdrop? If yes, then great. Maybe you actually legitimately want to explore some counterfactual fictional scenario or elements. Um, but if not, wouldn't you maybe instead be keen to use your regional knowledge to add detail and local flavor? make your setting feel very specific and authentic. So why invent a fantasy place that's inspired by a real culture, but not really? It's because reaching for that grab bag of pop culture theme tropes is just really easy and it sells. OK, enough picking on wow. Um, so out of ignorance of cultural specifics or a desire not to offend by getting things wrong and misrepresenting, or because you need a handy, thinly disguised fictional villain, um, these kind of anonymized, exoticized locations can be themselves offensive, suggesting that any cultural nuances are kind of trivial and meaningless. Or openly acknowledging that the intended audience won't care or know the difference. Uh, Kamal Nanjani uh, has a bit about Call of Duty where he points out that in scenes set in the real life city of Karachi in Pakistan, the street signs are in Arabic, not Urdu, the actual language of Pakistan. This should not be an intractable problem. <laughs> <laughs> they were literally like, the language they speak in Pakistan. I don't care. <laughs> so please, care. Whether you're using a real place or just using real world elements as inspiration for your fictional places, there is one clear solution to many of these ills. Do your research. Don't reach for that pop culture trope, grab bag. Go for the source. Be like Buffy and hit the books. And if you're drawing on a cultural background that isn't your own, uh, you have another route, which is to consult with someone who is familiar with that culture. Hopefully not like that one guy who worked on Voyager. <laughs> so we wove a lot of different cultural references into the world of Guns of Icarus. The idea was that it was a post-World War I alternate history where generations of war and political upheaval had led to mass migrations and mingling of cultures, so sort of new syncretic civilizations rose up. We reflected this in the place names, which draw from cultures across the globe. And for one corner of the map here, I reached out to an internet friend of mine, a Canadian woman of Romanian descent. And she helped devise some Romanian names and concepts for the settlements that appear here in the Mercantile Guild faction. Another faction, Yesha, drew heavily on Chinese language and iconography and folklore, visual styling. And we had a number of members on the team who were actually from Taiwan and China, and they contributed to the world building for these elements by supplying appropriate names and cultural background. So we're fortunate to have them actually on our team, but there are times when you need to look outside for help with representation. And there are people who are willing to consult, you know, whether it's a paid professional service um, or you know, just as a friend. But I do urge you to involve those outside voices in your process, bring them in, and you know, this is important, pay them too. Um, and just be willing to open yourself and your work to critique and to hear other points of view. Whatever happened to write what you know? 
Now, it's maybe not the best advice for creators of fantastic and speculative worlds. Try instead to start from what you know and then build on it. Imagine alternatives. Research outside your own experience. And yes, we definitely need more creators from marginalized and underrepresented groups representing their own perspectives and cultures. So look for opportunities to offer your support and amplify their voices. Uh, let them take part in the process and make space for them whenever you can and pay them. But when it's just you making your own work, you don't have to stick to a steady stream of autobiography based exclusively on your own cultural background and personal experience. Otherwise, you're just adding to the massive work that already reflects the narrow perspective of the dominant culture. Uh, don't be afraid to stray. Shut up. Oh, there we go. No. Uh, don't be afraid to stray from your lane, to make mistakes, uh, to rock the boat. It can be challenging in this current environment to open yourself up to criticism by stepping outside the mainstream. But if you do it mindfully and respectfully when you're creating worlds, it's so worth it. Gene Roddenberry, a white man, put an African woman with a Swahili-inspired name on the bridge of a starship. And it inspired generations, because representation really does matter. So when you're building new worlds, not even the sky is the limit. So just my appeal to you all is let's all try to extend our horizons, peek outside of our personal bubbles, and create some truly new worlds for us all to enjoy. Thank you. Established worlds. So we have quite an old game, for example, right. with some problems that we'd like to try and fix. Any advice on how we could do that without upsetting the existing players? That that is an excellent question. Um, I mean, and sometimes you know, media that we all love, you know, things that have been around like Star Trek for you know generations, or have like all this lore built up. There are some older ideas that are a little bit out of date now, or things that you couldn't get away with anymore. Um, one way is to just, and you know, Star Trek has done it. Plenty of things have done it. Just sort of like not mention those parts of canon anymore if we're referring to new things instead. Um, if it's something that's like sort of like a core character or it's like a very you know, heavily stereotyped representation or something, um, it's hard to like you know reboot or completely change the character. But you know if it's like a, a balance representation, like you can bring in new characters, to kind of offset the balance, and you know yeah, it's kind of tricky. I mean, um, I think there will there will always be someone that will cry like, you know, SJW is changing our favorite thing. It's always been the same. <laughs> um, but they'll always do that. And at the same time, there are the other people saying, hey, like, why is this so, you know, white, like, you know, straight, like, stereotype representations, whatever the you know, problems are that you're concerned about. So if you're going to be getting it from both sides, either way, follow your heart and do what's right, and you know, people will, you know, learn to love the new thing that you've created. Or if they don't, maybe they're not really your audience. Yes. Um, how do you know, in your line of work, when you're on the right track? I mean, it's. I think it's very difficult to, at least in my opinion, to mm -hmm. understand whenever you are building a geology, a political uh, world that fully fledged. I mean, how do you know that you are on the right track? Um, in terms of like representation questions, or just yes. in terms of like what you, you need for your project? Just an instinct you have at some stage that kicks in that say, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Or is um, it, do you have something? I mean, I, I have to start with my own instinct, but I think it is important to show it to other people that have different perspectives for me and will spot things that are in my blind spot. This is where, you know, having wide and diverse circles of friends you know, pays off, other than just how great it is to have wide and diverse circles of friends. Um, and again, if you don't have those friends, you can pay people to be your friends. And, uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, if I'm not comfortable with something, then I always try to work on it. But then once I'm like, yeah, I think this is okay, I 
I always want to like, to, like double check with somebody too. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up, I guess. All right. Thank you very much.